Good morning. I think it's appropriate on the sesquicentennial 150th anniversary of the postcard that we also acknowledge that it's the sesquicentennial of Belvedere Plain, <clears throat> a real estate development uh, from 1870. I believe it was completed around 1872. So I want to draw your attention to uh, where it is located on the shores of Vineyard Sound, nestled uh, in between the beach and what's known as, what was known then as Deacon's Pond. We now know it today as Falmouth Harbor. And you can see a lot of little postage stamp sized lots that were uh, planned out. And really most of them never um, wound up that way because when people came in to buy properties, they bought several at a, at a clip. So my focus today is on the postcards that depict uh, various scenes from around Belvedere Plain. And uh, there are about 20 and uh, I've added a few photographs and I'll even finish off with a plug for my book, which hopefully uh, Jill Erickson and uh, Kim DeWall can make available to you from the Falmouth Public Library. So let's go to the first slide. Most people recognize this house. It was owned by a family named Butler around the turn of the century. Fairly prominent on the point, it sits uh, today just behind the Falmouth Yacht Club. Uh, had a beautiful expansive lawn right on the harbor overlooking the ocean, a nice tennis court. And I found this picture in an old antiques uh, market in the Fenway section of Boston probably in the 1990s, and it hit my eye. I recognized it right away. But most importantly for me, uh, right over here on the right-hand side um, was an early photograph of Belvedere Plain, which is on the west side of the harbor. So I grabbed the picture and I expanded this section um, to what you see here. And for those of you familiar with the harbor, you'll recognize the home here that uh, once belonged to Bill Wyman and his family for probably 75 years. Um, uh, and you'll be able to see by the time we're done <clears throat> uh, various homes that are no longer no longer there, um, particularly these two, what we call beetle houses, which I'll point out a little later. Um, this photograph is about circa 1920, I, I would say. <clears throat> This photograph, uh, which I acquired on eBay from an auction, in my mind is the oldest known photograph of the Belvedere Plain. I don't wanna say absolutely positively because um, I don't have proof. So I'll leave that to a uh, younger generation to figure out for me. But the back side of this stereo card does say Falmouth Harbor. And uh, these, this is a, a windmill that drew water from the ocean um, onto flats where it dried in the uh, 19th century for salt. And uh, this hill here, um, 
I believe to be Falmouth Heights. It doesn't look that tall, but you know, perspective is very, um, a very tricky thing in the 1870s, 1880s. Um, I believe we can also date it from this man's hat, this man's hat. So uh, in time, uh, one of you might be able to um, research this to nail down uh, a date. And uh, these two structures here uh, might also help us. But um, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. The oldest beach photo of Belvedere Plain. Now I'd like to tell you about a book that I acquired from my father's second cousin, Rita Kekeisen. She was a librarian in the Butler Library at Columbia College in New York City. And when she passed away in 2003, uh, her family distributed her possessions and then asked me if I'd like to go in um, to uh, see if there was anything that I wanted because Rita and I had been uh, a 30 year correspondent, uh, had been correspondents for 30 years. She more or less was my mentor. She taught me everything uh, I needed to know to be a good, uh, thorough genealogist. My hobby has been uh, family tree research uh, practically all of my life. And uh, it really inspired my um, interest in the history of Belvedere Plain. So Mortimer J. Adler, he is um, a well-known editor in New York circles back in the day. And it struck me as very odd that he wrote a book entitled How to Read a Book. And uh, I had never seen anything like that before, so I read it cover to cover, and I'll give you the, uh, I'll give you the cliff notes. He essentially is um, asking us as, as the readers to imbibe every aspect of every book that we read. Don't just open it and start reading page one. Start at the flyleaf on the cover. Start uh, with the um, publisher page, publishing page. Read every line in the table of contents. Um, he really wants us to treat every book like a fine bottle of wine. Uh, savor every sip. And so I thought that was appropriate for this morning's talk because the same uh, rules can apply to postcards. We need to not just see them for a picture or a quick note, but uh, there's a lot more, there's a lot more behind it. And we can start with postage stamps. Now, if a postcard is 150 years old, then the first stamp that was designed for a postcard the one penny stamp in 1926 uh, means that an awful lot of postcards got shipped um, before and after for a penny. And in fact, it wasn't until 1952 that the rate went up. So if you see a postcard with a one penny stamp on it, it's not gonna be too, too helpful because there's, um, there's a 75 year period there where, where they posted for one cent. You get luckier from 1952 on because uh, postal rates um, seem to outpace inflation and they kept going up. And in fact, if you see, for example, a postcard uh, with, uh, seven cents on the stamp, you can actually tell yourself, you can actually date that postcard to three months in 
1975. So as you see, the dating methodology uh, becomes much uh, clearer the later you get. Now at some point, and I don't know when this was, but probably in the 2000s, um, these became, these stamps became forever stamps. So I don't know if 2006 is, um, applies, but if you see a postcard with a forever stamp, that's 24 cents, you, it could have been posted last week. I mean, they last forever. Um, here's an example of an early, uh, I think 1902, one cent Franklin stamp. So you'll see a lot of these on postcards. I think Lady Liberty is on one. In 1952, uh, it went to two cents, but uh, this is an early two cent stamp from 1902, uh, which you would not have seen on a postcard. So going by Mortimer J. Adler's um, methodology, what are all the ways that we can um, partake of postcards? We know there's a picture on the front side. Um, if we're lucky, we see a really beautiful postmark on the back. Here's Falmouth, Mass, July 28th, 1 p.m., 1943. Uh, you can't get any better than that. Um, Another thing you can determine from a postcard, oh, and by the way, see the one cent Lady Liberty stamp here. Um, obviously, we've got until 1952 before that goes up to two cents. Published by E.D. West Company, South Yarmouth, Mass. You can actually go on eBay or, you know, your favorite flea market and collect postcards that were published by E.D. West, there are a number of different companies. You can collect all of them, and they oftentimes uh, will number them so you can uh, collect them in sequence. Once in a while, you can also identify the photographer. Um, that's a little bit tricky. You sort of have to find his body of work first and then uh, tie it in to a postcard. The other things that postcards tell you are the sender and the recipient. Those are sometimes uh, fascinating. And uh, this particular one tells you that, this, that the um, vacationer stayed at the Catalpa Cottage on Shore Street in Falmouth um, in July of 1943. So uh, if you happen to live at that address, you might know Cokie and Mrs. Carl Goldschmark, Riverside Drive, New York City. So there, as you can see, there are many, many interesting aspects to a postcard. This is the earliest postcard in my collection. Um, I date it to 1905. It shows Belvedere Plain in the foreground. These, um, these uh, beetle-shaped roof lines, uh, they were probably practical to um, have wind off the beach go right over the house. Uh, though not very successful because in 1938, these two were knocked off their foundation by the hurricane. This one still stands at the tail end of Spinnaker Lane. One thing you'll notice about early postcards, 1900 maybe to 1910, is that the, um, the pictures do not extend to the boundary of the paper. That's a function of the technology. They, uh, once they got very popular, they quickly learned how to uh, print these 
by bleeding the photograph off the edge of the, of the uh, card. And this is another trick that you can try with, uh, I use a, a photo editing software called Adobe Photoshop, and I can take that same postcard, um, get rid of the arrow where the sender was staying, get rid of an ink mark, um, clean it up, brighten it up, and um, make it presentable for, and in, in my case, for the book that I was publishing. You need a good scanner and you need a good software program. I highly recommend Adobe products. Here is a postcard taken from the old stone dock in Falmouth, which used to be Falmouth's Harbor at the end of Shore Street. And you see the same view, the, um, the uh, houses here along the beach in Belvedere Plain. You can see Falmouth Heights in the distance, a couple of young boys uh, running down the jetty and some sailboats. Again, this would need to be heavily cleaned up. I don't think I used this one in the book. I used another copy that I found that was much cleaner. Oh, this must be it. Um, and what I would do is just brighten it up so that when it's printed in the book, it's, um, it's, uh, it becomes clearer and uh, black and white versus this is scanned in color. This is a picture of the old harbor from the other side. And oops, and uh, there's a nice little um, note here. Please send as usual to last address by Tuesday if possible. E. B. Salandon. He was probably looking for a rent of his on his summer cottage. I include uh, this photograph of the Heights from around the same time period, 19, 1905, because uh, <clears throat> you can see from a uh, perspective, from a different perspective at the end of this long uh, wooden wharf, the Butler house that was in the first photograph that I shared with you. <clears throat> this is the uh, Tower House Hotel which I think came down in about 1950. Jill, Jill will know better <clears throat> on that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me for a minute. <clears throat> I had to get a drink of water. So in this uh, photograph, you can see the um, windmill that was on the uh, old Waterside estate. And you can also see the uh, Weinberg house here. So that was built in, I think, 1914. And it looks pretty new, the wood looks clean. So I would date this postcard to 1914. Um, let's take a look at the next one. It is um, the mouth of the harbor being dredged by the barge Wollaston and it was colorized, obviously. And we can also see that by 1910, the um, pictures are bleeding off the edge of the postcard. There's our focal point that always tells us where we are, the Butler House on the, uh, on the end of Falmouth Heights. This, by the way, was Clinton Road. Clinton Avenue used to uh, run right across here. And that's essentially what they're digging away is the, um, the spit of land across which was Clinton. This is a really great photograph that shows uh, in perfect detail um, that activity in 1919. You can see the name on the barge here, the Wollaston. And these two were dredging 
the harbor. There are a number of um, aspects to this photograph that help to date it. This is the William Wyman house on the edge of the harbor. This is the um, tower on 11 Wheeling Avenue, which uh, came down in, I believe around 1913. So we know that uh, this was taller. This used to be taller in its day. Um, this house, number four Wheeling Avenue, burned to the ground. I'd have to look up the actual year that that happened. Number one Wheeling Avenue. This is 20 Tim Nye's Cartway, 16 Tim Nye's Cartway. Those are the houses in which I grew up as a boy. Um, and this is the um, back end of 151 Clinton Avenue, which sits on the edge of Tim Nye's Cartway. And this is the house on the, at the foot of Sheridan Avenue on Clinton Avenue, uh, on the corner of Clinton and Sheridan. And you can see how all of this land was vacant at that time. So when the family who lived in our family homes was here in 19, up until 1925, uh, they had a beautiful uninterrupted view of the harbor. This house here, um, is um, I can't think of the family's name, but this is also gone and has been replaced by a new house. If I think of it, I'll mention it later. Postcards were also made from pictures, from photographs that you could mail into a company uh, and they'll return back to you a set of 10 or 20. This happens to have been a photograph taken by a member of the Lowry family. Mrs. Lowry was Bill Wyman's mother. And this house front and center is uh, 43 Harrisburg. It's now been moved right up to the water. This is the Tim Nye Cartway house that my family um, moved to in 1967. This is number one Wheeling Avenue on the corner of Gerard. This is the old Lowry house with the tower. This uh, house is number four Wheeling Avenue that burned to the ground and is gone. You can still see some, uh, you can still see some concrete foundation markers there, uh, unless they've been re removed recently. And this is one of the uh, beetle-shaped homes that was knocked off its foundation by the hurricane in 1938. So that is now gone and it's a private, private community beach. Here are the two homes that were knocked off their foundation. Uh, they're both, uh, they're both gone. They must have been beautiful, beautiful homes right on the beach. Again, this is a photograph that was turned into a postcard. There are notes and stamps on the back. This is a similar view, probably around 1914. You can see some familiar structures. These are the two uh, Wheeling Avenue homes that were destroyed. And this is the Weinberg house on Gerard Avenue. Um, brand spanking new, I would say. The, uh, the wood looks, still looks bright and clean. Uh, it hasn't aged. So this postcard is very likely 1915, 1914. And uh, there's a nice wooden pier here that 
uh, that is no longer there. Same view, um, showing a, a better perspective on the uh, houses on the, at the end of Harrisburg. Um, this is the Drummond house now. Um, this is the Burns house. Again, the homes on Wheeling Avenue, the two, I don't know why I want to call them eyebrow houses, but uh, the two beetle, beetle houses on Wheeling Avenue and the Weinberg home. It's a beautiful beach. My father loved this beach. He used to, this is the, uh, now, uh, this is now the, the neighborhood beach where this house used to be. And my father would sit there and say to me, or he said to me one day, how could you believe that God doesn't exist when uh, he created such beauty as this beach? <laughs> he, was, he was enraptured. <laughs> this is a fascinating shot. It took me a while uh, to uh, stare at this photograph to understand what exactly I was looking at. But it clearly says Deacon's Pond Harbor, the fleet at anchor, Falmouth Heights, Mass. So here's the harbor. Um, it has access to the ocean, but it doesn't really look like this is where Falmouth Heights should be. And it took me uh, a little while to determine that the publisher had reversed the shot. So when we turn this around, you will see this makes sense. Here are the two beetle houses on the end of Wheeling Avenue. Here is the Wyman House, the jetty at the end of the harbor. Here's the, uh, where the clam shack is at the um, tail end of Clinton Avenue. And um, this is the house that I'm trying to remember the name of, and it will come to me. Uh, this house, I don't recognize, but uh, one of you may, or, or Jill might be able to help us out, a house with two little outbuildings um, a little further down on Scranton, so I wouldn't be as familiar with it, but uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure we'll get it identified. And in, in, the, uh, in this shot, you can see the same house with the two outbuildings somewhere down along Scranton Avenue. Um, if you find out, let me know. I'd like to know who that is. I skipped past this one, but I do want to uh, point out that this is Waterside at the end of Shore Street at the beach where you um, turn that 90 degree turn <clears throat> along the uh, public beach there. I don't quite recognize these homes, but um, with a little further analysis, I'm sure we could figure them out. And this home here is across Shore Street on the other side, and it belonged at the time to uh, an old Navy man named Richard Olney. There's probably quite a bit written about him that you can look up at the library. It's a nice shot, colorized, obviously. I love this shot. It must have been taken right after the harbor was dredged because these two jetties look brand new. They still look like piles of rock. And uh, the beach is still kind of um, taking the contour of where the old uh, spit of land used to be. This is all fill, very clearly all fill. And um, this house, someone can identify for us on Falmouth Heights. I don't recognize it, but it, I'm sure it's been gone for a very long time. And just out of frame here would be the uh, Butler House, our, our point of reference on on Falmouth Heights. Oh, and it even says New Harbor. So that's a brand spanking new photograph.
1919. Um, this is a photograph, not a postcard, but a photograph that a neighbor uh, sent to me, taken from an airplane. You can see um, Falmouth Harbor. Clinton, have, Clinton Avenue has been cut. So this is uh, post 1919, 19, 1920 maybe. And you can see Clinton Avenue here. Uh, this house on what is now Settler's Path uh, is brand new. So I'm guessing 1920s for sure. And uh, this is the little inlet at the mouth of Falmouth Harbor. I blew it up a little <clears throat> to get a better view, but obviously the plane was shaking. So whoever took the photograph had to contend with uh, a little vibration. Um, you can see the colonnaded uh, building here, <clears throat> which uh, I forget what that was, but <clears throat> we'll be able to identify that. This is Harrisburg. This is Timothy Nye's Cartway, Clinton Avenue. Uh, this house, um, uh, Vivian Center lived in for years and years and years, and I interviewed her for my book, uh, as I did um, many of these residents. And you can see the Butler House right here, and the Tower Hotel. It's too bad. <clears throat> it's really too bad that this wasn't clearer, because it's just an amazing old shot that you just wouldn't see otherwise. This photograph um, was taken about 1920 by Theodore Gerloff, the father of Miss Anna Gerloff, who was quite el elderly when I uh, knew her in the uh, late 1900s. But it was probably taken um, right after this house was built on Harrisburg Lane. You can see the roof line of the two beetle-shaped houses that were blown down in 1938. You can see the tower here on the Lowry House has been brought down in height. This is one of my favorites. Again, um, 1920, these two big sloops here, you can see a couple of old uh, Model Ts that were still hanging around. And um, this house, which is the big yellow mansion that belonged to, to Dr. K. Leland for many years, um, I believe that went up in 1920. So let's see, I've got my, I believe that went up in 1920. So we can date. Uh, we can date the uh, postcard, if it didn't have a postmark on the back, to about that period. And this is a similar shot. This was one where, um, you know, I mentioned that all aspects of the postcard are, are fascinating. And this one was kind of fun because it was from one young sailor to a friend back home. And uh, he, he says, he wrote, Dear Newbold, we're having a fine time up here and wish you were near us. Will you come to lunch when we get home? Bayard Kane Fox, uh, posted 1935 and uh, addressed to Master Newbold Black. Two school, school chums keeping in touch with one another. And um, I wanted to show this uh, circa 1952 aerial shot 
of Falmouth Harbor. Um, this is the Butler House. This is the Yacht Club, the Tides Motel. Belvedere Plain pretty much encompasses this entire flat land. Uh, and you can see even, even by 1952 standards, quite a lot was not yet developed. There's a lot of uh, open land. And in, in the uh, early days, in the 1800s, people would buy lots along Clinton Avenue that stretched in long rectangles all the way back to Main Street. So a lot of these lots, if you follow their history, they uh, go back from Clinton Avenue to Main Street. And the Belvedere Plain, as we saw from the early development map, probably stopped at, King, uh, at Queen Street and everything beyond would fall under the uh, classification of Falmouth Center. This is a closer view. You can start to see some of the houses that um, are familiar in, uh, on Belvedere Plain. This is the Robertson House. This is the um, Regatta the Regatta Hotel. This is the Regatta Restaurant. It's a nice clear shot. I'm not sure where I got it. I probably bought it on eBay. And then the, this is a, a close up. Clinton Avenue. This is um, Sheridan Avenue. This is the Wyman House. And then I wanted to uh, just add in this um, later view, probably 1950-ish, 1945 maybe, shows the Butler House, um, the, um, the, uh, oh, the old sailor, what is his name? Begins with the letter G. Gallagher, Gallagher used to live in this house next to the Yacht Club and the um, Tower House hotel. So in 2003, I believe, I published the stories of the various families who lived on Belvedere Plain, and I included photographs and chapters on each of their houses, and I did research on a lot of the um, titles, land titles, the deeds that passed, and put it all together into, uh, into book form, published it. I was very, uh, very happy to get it in print because I had talked to a good many neighbors and had scraps of paper you know, it, <clears throat> from my various interviews. With them. It really was a fascinating hobby. Um, I started when I was probably 13 or 14, uh, and I loved, just loved hearing stories of the history of the neighborhood. Oh, and I want to show you this postcard because the cover of my book, see these green shutters and red roof, uh, comes from this postcard. So obviously I, oh, and you know, I think the back cover, uh, this extends to the back cover. This would be the spine, and this is the front cover of the book. This is, a, this is another one of my favorite postcards. Um, this book is out of print. There are no, there are no more copies, although you can, um, read it at the Falmouth Public Library, they have, they have a copy. But I, I uh, expanded it and republished it in 2018 with this cover. Um, 
no slip cover, just a hard cover book and called it The Belvedere Plane Revisited. It's approximately twice the number of pages, uh, quite a few more photographs and a number of new stories from people who, um, who let me know that I forgot about them in the first, in the first printing. So we got them in to this one. And I think that's it. Ah, here's the author as a young man, 1967. Um, when we first, when my family first arrived in Falmouth. 